Great day for Eric Stark. Now, this circuit here on Lac Lama is so unpredictable, Jonathan. What makes this circuit so challenging, and how can the drivers best conquer it in qualifying today? Well, the big issue about this circuit is that we are really on an enormous lake here, as you can see, and uh, you get rollers coming in from the, the wash from some of the, uh, the little boats that are around the circuit. But you can see there, we come into turn number one, 450 meters, normally into two and three, which is relatively calm. Then 360 meters down into number four, that's the only right hand that we have here, and 590 meters, and this is where it gets really tricky, five and six. The roller's coming in here quite strongly, so through five, through six, and down past the start-finish line again. Well, a lot of drama, Jonathan, especially we expect down at the west end of the circuit down towards turn five and six. Now, Evian is a circuit everybody wants to conquer, and a large field of 18 drivers from 11 different nations are here for the final European round of the year. Let's take a look at the entry list and how they'll come for this weekend's Grand Prix of France. Alice Corella, four-time world champion here, chasing points. As you look farther down, Sean Torrente was the points leader going into London. He had a terrible weekend, picked up nothing. Eric Stark benefited. He won the race in London. Now he has three career victories for him. Uh, and then Philippe Shep, of course, he is a three-time world champion. He has never, ever finished a race here in Evian. The Grand Trask was looking stronger and stronger as the weekend went on in London. As was Sami Celio. We expect big things out of him. Jonas Anderson was very quick in morning practice. Eric Edden looking to go to the uh, top six Q3 one more time. Francesco Catando starting his 172nd start. Marit Strumoy looking for her second career pole position. And then Cedric de Guin along with uh, Mette Bjorkness. That is the French Maverick team. So it'll be interesting to see how they do today under the pressures of being from France. Now the official BRM qualifying. Here's how it'll work today. We'll have three qualifying sessions beginning with Q1 which is 20 minutes in length eliminating all but the top 12 fastest drivers. Now, after a short intermission, it's on to Q2, even more dramatic, running for 15 minutes with six of the slowest drivers being eliminated, leaving us with Q3 in the top six shootout, where each driver will go out one at a time for two solo laps as they pursue their hopes and dreams of capturing the quick time and earning pole position, winning the BRM qualifying trophy, and starting off on the dock, number one, to lead the field for tomorrow's 22nd Grand Prix of France. And wow, the temperature today, Jonathan, sky high, as are the hopes of running through this full one, two, and three Q3 process today. Now, this is the fourth year that we've come here and Jonathan, the first three years, including the last two, we never even got out to qualify on a Saturday. No, that's right, Steve. I mean, the water's been incredibly rough. And again, this week, when we arrived on Wednesday, we wouldn't have been able to hold a Grand Prix, but luck has been on our side every year so far. And this year, the conditions are probably better than we've seen in a long time. Having said that, I've just looked on the far end of the circuit, and I can see one of the, uh, the ferry boats is actually crossing. It's a little way from the circuit, but that wash of that boat is eventually going to come onto the circuit. So for these guys to get a good qualifying position in the first session, they really do need to get out there as quick as they can, take uh, advantage of the, the relatively calm conditions we have at the moment, because trust me, as this qualifying goes on, it's going to get a lot rougher out there. Well, there you see Philippe uh, Desertin. Now, uh, he won a race when he was racing back in 2002. He won the Grand Prix in Helsinki. They also held the Grand Prix in La Rochelle back 10 years ago. But there you see all eyes will be on this uh, Shenzhen China Formula One team. Why? Because on your right is the man who leads this championship, Philippe Shep, in his 16th season. He's got 27 points on the year. He hasn't won a race yet. He finished third in Portimao after starting fifth, and he finished second in London. Now, interestingly enough, this is his uh, daughter who is here. And Fanny is on the headsets. Why? Because she is talking to her husband, which happens to be, of course, Philippe Chef's uh, son-in-law, Peter Morin, the driver. And they're both from uh, Rouen in France. So you've got uh, father and son-in-law out there racing side by side. And for Peter Morin, you see him right there in that number eight machine. What a great, great day he had, Jonathan, uh, two weeks ago in London. He qualified his career best fourth, got on the podium for the very first time in his career. This is only his second season. He has run eight career starts in Formula One. Now, he was an endurance driver, as we hear the two-minute sign before we'll send the drivers out. Remember, we're about set to go with Q1. It'll be 20 minutes in length. And again, interesting, let's talk a little bit about the strategy in Q1, Jonathan. 
you want to set a fast time and you want to get out of the way from the bottom feeders who are going to be fighting for those final uh, six positions to get in. Yeah, I mean, basically, you've got to get out there fairly quickly. You can see that some of the rolls are already coming in because these boats do like to run on very slick, calm water. And what happens with these rollers are there's sometimes about three or four feet between them. So you've got to be really careful at that boat. If you get it on the top of the water and get it running very, very fast here today, that it doesn't actually nosedive. So, you know, as I say, it's important to get out early, get out before the, the, uh, the waves from that ferry boat on the far end of the circuit start moving into the race circuit itself and post a, a fairly solid time. And again, very much into the second session, the same, the same type of uh, idea. Luis Ribeiro, the race director out of Portugal, has been a longtime race director here for the UIM and for Formula One, gives the drivers the one minute signal. Now, as we talked about earlier in the course description, Jonathan, we mentioned about how much uh, other traffic play on this lake. This lake is 50 miles or about 75 to 80 kilometers long. And over on the far side, there you can see people uh, water skiing. You've got the big uh, schooner coming back in toward port. He won't be able to be allowed in here until qualifying is over. So he'll be sitting out there. But we've got a nice spectator fleet out on the far side of this course. As you look out onto the race course, you're looking at across at uh, Lausanne, uh, Switzerland. And uh, this is such a beautiful view. If you look farther down, you can't see it, but around the corner is uh, Geneva in Switzerland. We're not too far into from the Swiss border here in France, but uh, this place is very unique, a lovely spa city, and now we get the whistle, we are underway, and we begin counting as we're in a minute or so before the drivers will get a chance to go around, get their uh, warm-up laps involved, and then we'll start counting down on this 20 minutes of Q1 job. Yeah, guy to watch out for in this uh, entire session actually is Eric Stark. As you said earlier, Steve, he won the Grand Prix in London, running for himself there. And uh, we noticed that uh, Team Abu Dhabi have obviously decided that they're going to run a third boat in the championship this year. They could see that he, he performed brilliantly there. And uh, he's, he's moved in with Team Abu Dhabi for the rest of the season, which I think is well deserved, bearing in mind that, you know, he was struggling up until that, uh, t uh, up until this time, his sponsorship. Yeah, the Merrick, uh, as you watch the uh, Maverick team pulling away, and of course, uh, that is the Frenchman coming out there. Cedric de Guigny is one of a, a couple of drivers who are second generation drivers out here today. And of course, uh, Grant Trask with his father, Bob Trask, who ran so many times did his uncle, David Trask. And um, there you see the very unusual boat, the Blaze boat from Franz Catano, the driver who is uh, kicking off his 172nd start. And it all started here a year ago, Jonathan, with that boat. Yeah, and they've had a bit of an uphill battle, but thankfully there's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel there because slowly but surely he's been gaining speed, gaining confidence in the boat and uh, he's getting it to somewhere where he needs it to be at the moment so uh, a good performance from that uh, blaze board is 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 expected probably in the next couple of three races yeah Mattia Borkness just leaving the uh, young woman from Norway who is getting her second career start and uh, here you see the final few boats there's Sean Torrente and that's not a good sign Jonathan they got the engine Ooh. cover up and uh, I'll tell you what, he came out like gangbusters to start the season. One from Poland, Portugal, had a terrible weekend in London. Now he's getting, looks like we got a little bit more of a problem here. Yeah, just checking to see what they're doing. This is a, a three liter uh, V6, uh, beg your pardon, 2.5 liter V6 uh, uh, output engine pushing out around 400 horsepower. And it's never a good thing when uh, people are panicking around the back of that engine as we pick up uh, Philippe Chap, the uh, three time. Uh, Formula One champion, Steve, and uh, a guy that really does want to do well here this weekend. Yeah, let's talk about Shemba. we got a moment where we got all eyes glued on the uh, the driver from Rouen who has won this championship, as you mentioned, three different times. He's had terrible luck in France. Last year, he qualified second, had a great, brilliant uh, morning. When we ran everything because of the bad weather on Saturday for BRM qualifying a year ago. He qualified second but dropped out and finished 18th. He dropped out early as you go on board. The uh, French driver right now as he heads down over on the east side of the race course. And uh, he dropped out three different races in a row, Jonathan, as we pick yeah. him up. <clears throat> yeah, you can see now, St Steve, they're not able to run at full chat at the moment because those rollers 
Although the water looks relatively calm out there, it definitely is not. So let's watch the uh, the way that he uh, runs the boat on the top of the water. He's been extremely careful at the moment. They're waiting for this water to settle down, and hopefully then they'll be able to put the hammer down and uh, put up some uh, impressive uh, lap times. But you can see there, Steve, as we said earlier on, between turn number five and number six, very, very lumpy water. This is going to prove to be quite a difficult uh, qualifying session. Yeah, and again, they're uh, trying to set the, the figure of the driver is sitting there trying to anticipate, are the conditions best now or do I wait? So you play a bit of a strategy here. You want to throw down a good time and do it quickly, but at the same time, you know in the back of your mind, hey, it might only get better here because we had a lot of traffic from the cross flow of other boats that aren't involved in the Grand Prix, just boat traffic out here. And uh, we're feeling the effects of it right now with some of these drivers still fighting away these rogue waves, as we call them. Yeah, but as you know, the other thing is, of course, do you go for it now and take a chance? Or do you hang, hang about maybe for another 10 minutes? But the problem there, Steve, is that it could, in fact, get even worse. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of guesswork going out there at the moment. The team, the crew uh, chiefs uh, talking to the, uh, to the drivers there, trying themselves to read the water, which is really difficult. And... Uh, it's going to be a right battle that we have here this afternoon. Well, you talked about times, and the thing is, this morning in practice, when it was like a mill pond out here, there was no wave action whatsoever, and there really was very few boats out here. 49.06, Eric Stark threw down 152-kilometer practice time. Well, right now, the best time is Peter Moran, as they continue to work on Sean Torrente's engine, is a 56.69, so we're still about six seconds off the pace. And again, um, Tell you what, uh, they're scrambling here with that number six machine. Yeah, I could see that they'd undone some of the fuel lines there. Um, and one part they looked like they were changing was uh, the uh, fuel pressure regulator that was on the top. So they've obviously looked at the telemetry because that tells them everything about the boat and the engine, the fuel pressure and so on and so forth. They've obviously seen that there is a drop off in fuel pressure and they're hoping that by changing this fuel regulator that keeps the fuel pressurized to run into this engine, maybe that might solve a problem. As you take a look at the other uh, Team Abu Dhabi boats, now remember they've got three drivers and what they did was they sent their third driver, the youngster, as they shuffled off back to Formula 2 as they took Rashid Alquemzi, who raced in only one race, Jonathan. He started 11th in Portugal, finished 13th. They decided that he needed a little bit more seasoning, so they shipped him back to back to Formula 2. Uh, you know, he won the championship a year ago, but they thought, well, let's get a chance to put this man in it. Eric Stark, what a story for him, the driver from Sweden, who didn't even know until about two weeks before the season started that he was going to even get a chance to race. And uh, Stark got a chance to go and uh, hop into the boat, join the Maverick team, and uh, race by race was being funded. And then all of a sudden, he had such a wonderful weekend last year. He won. He was third in the championship a year ago. As we now take a look at Ahmed al Hamli, the driver who's seventh in this championship. He's got eight points. His 12th season. He finished eighth in London. He finished sixth in Portimao. He's qualified well. He was up in the top six Q3 in Portugal. Did not get there in London. No, no. Interestingly, at the moment, we've con got Cantando there that uh, is the fastest driver out there, but way off the times that we had this morning. Cantando is probably the most experienced driver here on this circuit uh, this weekend, and that's probably beginning to show. So maybe the guys with the most horsepower and the quickest boats out there are not going to show as well this weekend as the guys that have got the slightly longer boats that can carry them easier on these very, very rough conditions. You can see Al Hamri there now, again, looking for fairly clear water. As Looking from the screen here, looks very, very calm, but believe me, I've been seeing these rollers coming in, and it, it's tricky out there. Yeah, it's survival of the fittest, Jonathan. Anybody, it depends on how they can run, and they have to be very, they have to govern themselves a very bit astutely. You have to be very careful not to uh, overdrive the boat. We've seen so many accidents here before because this lake is so unpredictable. It's so big, and as you said, there's a lot of rogue waves and swells here, so you got to be a little judicious. Take your time, find out what you think is the right moment, and go for it, and hopefully you can lay down a good time. Again, the top 12 are in queue number one. As you can see, how much time's left. We've just uh, cruised past the first six minutes with 14 and a half minutes coming up here shortly of a 20-minute session, and you look out, and uh, the driver who is in his 12th season, Ahmed Al Hamli, 
as a driver from the UAE in his 77th start. He's got 10 poles, so he knows how to move to the front, Jonathan. One out of about every seven races, he'll grab a pole position. But again, the story for him has been his medical history in the past. He, he really has come back from uh, just a tremendously difficult year back uh, about four years ago and uh, had a brain tumor and had to sit out the rest of the season, was actually leading the championship when that all happened and he came storming back and it's a good story now. Now we shift our attention, Sami Celio. Interestingly, let's just see what he's gonna be doing here because I did notice that uh, one or two of the boats are actually running five blade propellers here rather than four blade. And with a five blade propeller, when these conditions get as rough as they are out here, in my experience when I was racing, okay, I mean, it's been a little while now, but a five blade propeller is more like a paddle wheel on the back of the, uh, uh, on the back of the gear case. And it does definitely allow the boat to run a lot looser on the water, but at the same time, it, it, it just makes it a lot easier for the driver to control that boat. So we're just seeing there, there's a, a four blade come off and uh, another one going on. We can't see whether that's a five or is he maybe going for sli something slightly smaller, slightly bigger, uh, only time will tell. But Sammy Serio now, Steve, he's running one of the, the, in fact, it is the latest Baba boat. And the information that I've had is that it's it's a little bit like the old style boat they ran a few years ago, a bit more stable and uh, it'll be interesting to see how he gets All right, on. We'll see how that pans out. Good news for Sean Torrente and the American side and Team Abu Dhabi, he's back out there motoring around we'll see if they've been able to solve the problem eric edden has gone to the top picking it up 54 3 jonathan again we're not quite through the halfway point of this first session torrente they're lifting the lid out he's not going uh, very quickly yet but uh, it'll be interesting to see how it pans out here uh, yeah. as he gets his uh, man back that is his uh, radio man who actually was racing Two weeks ago in Europe, he's got his own series that he's involved in, and Sean said he really missed him. He was glad to get him back on the headset, steering him through all this traffic and helping him out any way he can. Yeah, yeah, again, DAC now changing propellers. They're running four blade propellers out there th this afternoon. These propellers are made by a number of different companies around the world, and uh, so you never know. They never let on exactly whose propeller they're running, what size propeller. It's, uh, it's quite an art in setting these boats up and choosing the right propeller for the circuit. Nice run for Torrente, slowing down third quickest time. Just lost the spot because Bartak Marzouak just threw down a sizzler with a 54.76. Sizzler for these conditions, of course. Again, we talk about the difference between five seconds this morning when it was dead calm and uh, to what the conditions are now is being roughed up. Yeah. and. All they're doing really for the first session because they, they just want to get up in, up into the uh, into the t the next uh, slot. So uh, you know they're not going to be doing too much. They're not going to be sticking their necks out too much. They're just going to be watching the times, seeing what everybody else is doing. Some of these lead boats, and uh, as long as they can get in there into the top uh, into the top 13 boats, then they know they're going to be safe. But on the bubble at the moment, we've got Cantando who a few minutes ago was right at the top of the uh, the time sheets there. He's now dropped back down to 12. Now he's dropped down to 13. Benevente just taken over from him. So it's pretty tough there, you know, in that uh, in that middle group as to who in fact is going to be the, the, the driver to get through into the next session. Yeah, real tight right now, Jonathan, about four tenths of a second as you look at uh, Simone Schiff, the driver from Dusseldorf, the 43-year-old. This is only for her, her uh, second event that she's getting a chance to run in. And uh, she's doing her best to come out and try to uh, lay a statement on. Actually, this is her third race. She qualified 17th in Portugal, finished 15th, and then 18th. She failed to finish in London. So she's hoping to work her way up. It's it's a giant learning curve for anybody coming into Formula One, and this is what she's finding right now. Oh, yeah, you can tell. I mean, she's not done too bad in Formula Two by all accounts, but, uh, you know, she is really just feeling her way as we pick up our other lady driver here. This afternoon, uh, Marek Stromoy um, from Norway. She's running one of Massimo Rogero's boats. Uh, and uh, normally, when the conditions get fairly lumpy and tough out there, this is a very, very well-balanced boat. So watch out for her this afternoon. Yeah, as we take a look now, Philippe Shep slides back up into the number two spot. So uh, as you take a look at uh, Great Stromoy, and she is... Uh, Mr. Goy talking with her, and for Marie, she's pushing hard. She's up in the 10th spot. She's about two seconds off the pace. 
But right now, she is in by about three-tenths of a second, right, John Jonathan? And, of course, Grant Trask right now on the bubble, sitting in that 12th spot. And uh, tell you what, uh, he's going to have to go faster, too. So right now, you can see less than uh, 10 minutes to run. And uh, now we start turning the wake up. Torrente back in. I don't know, my friend. Uh, Torrente is in that fifth spot. But uh, what do you think they're doing here now? Well, they're just waiting at the moment. I mean, they, they, they don't want to do any more than they have to. They don't want to take any chances. And he's in fifth. He's the second off. But that really doesn't, uh, you know, he's certainly not shown his trump card yet. So it's a case of sit there, make sure that you don't go too far down in this time session. If you feel that you're getting quite near that bubble, then obviously he'll have to get back out there. But uh, no point just going round and round and risking anything at this stage. Yeah, Marine Stromoy, as she had her first ever career pull back in 2011, and Portimao, she slammed the door on 17 men and became the first woman ever in the history of this sport to grab pole position. And in that race, by the way, in Portimao back in 2011, she was leading the race until there was the first stoppage, and they had a yellow flag situation. And she and Sean Torrente got together on the restart, and the two of them took off like one huge airplane wing and both the spectacularly barrel rolled. And if you know this sport, that's a photo that's been passed around a lot since 2011, a spectacular crash. And now this is a boat, you can see there, number 10 boat, that's a, a Moore boat, uh, built in France, in fact, by David Moore and uh, run here by uh, Duarte Benevente from Portugal. And he may do okay here because that boat is not as short as some of these little sprint boats that the top teams have. So should, in theory, be able to run on these rough conditions a lot better. And Benevente at the moment, he's down in 15th, so uh, he's going to have to uh, do something in the next se seven minutes if uh, if he's going to get into that next session. Yeah, forget the position right now, Jonathan. The most important figure is he's three-tenths of a second off, and he needs to find those three-tenths uh, of a second as you look at his father, Mario Benevente. And, of course, they were quite, quite animated in London when they were they're having a dinner in the restaurant and they were cheering and screaming for their Portuguese football side and uh, I'll tell you what uh, we're gonna see if he gets that animated in these final seven minutes as we try to see if uh, Dwarf Benevente can move up and move into Q2 still hasn't ever gotten his first pole position it's hard to believe with a talented driver like him this is his 138 start as we now look at Jonas Anderson who is lightning quick this morning yeah, yeah. Again, a fairly short boat here. Jonas uh, works very closely with uh, uh, Christian Molgat from um, from uh, up in uh, Scandinavia and uh, been developing this boat now over the last couple of three years. It might look quite similar to some of the other boats, but it definitely is not. And Jonas at the moment, Steve, he's in that 14 slot. He's going to have to do something fairly quickly with six minutes to go. Yeah, he's going to have to figure out the formula to success here in a hurry as his wife is on the headsets with him, chatting with him. And, of course, Jonas Anderson's been on the podium here in France. This is the fourth year that we've come to Evian. Back in the first year, in 2015, he started uh, sixth, made it to Q3, and went on to finish runner-up. He finished second, and uh, he was fifth last year. He dropped out in 2016. So he's had his ups and downs. Jonas Anderson, very talented driver. This is his 90th career start, and he's a two-time world champion in the Formula 2 series. Came up the same time as Jay Price did. Yeah, and that little boat that he's running here this weekend, believe me, Steve, he's got a handful on his plate out there now. Um, you can see that when he was trying to take a tight line there on the bottom turn, he had to switch to the outside of the uh, and go really wide. But uh, he's going for it again at the moment. He's 14, 2.32 off, and looks like he's getting the getting to grips with these rough conditions out here, and seems to be starting to put the put the put the throttle down now, and uh, maybe we see him move up. Yeah, we got a Scandinavian fight here, Jonathan. The difference between Jonas Anderson and Celio one one hundredth of a second. Celio digging, clawing, and scratching his way in that 13th spot. He needs something to move ahead or at least get past. Grant Trask, who's about eight one hundredths of a second ahead of him, as you see Massimo Ruggiero, the uh, longtime and talented driver, a three time winner on the tour, a boat builder for many years for Baba. And he is there on the headsets talking with uh, Sami Celio and trying to help him uh, along here. You see Cantando there on the outside, he's definitely running that boat a lot looser on the water than anybody else at the moment. Looking quite, uh, 
quite settled there, but again, down in 11th position, so he's going to have to start pushing uh, if he needs to get into this next session. And we've got Sammy Sellio there now in the 11 boat. This is the Baba we were on about that they've slightly modified and uh, seems to be going that little bit better. All right, Sellio now working and pushing as hard as he can. Now, he's lost a spot since the last time we were talking about him. He slid down another spot. He's in the 14th position. Stromoy is losing ground. She's down into the 12th position. So with less than five minutes to go, the pressure's starting to build. This is getting very, very tight, Jonathan. I'll tell you what, this is getting tremendously exciting as we watch them come through here, Jonathan. Yeah, Sally will just come through again for another lap, but doesn't seem to have improved. He's still in that fourth instant position. Uh, Massimo Ruggiero there from Northern Italy that uh, owns the Baba um, racing team and, and obviously builds the boats there, uh, not far from Lake Como, and uh, obviously he wants Sammy to do well because this is their shop window. This is the new boat that they've developed and obviously if he wants to sell boats in the future The only way you'll sell boats is by getting your existing boat that's out there to perform really well Well, you had a chance to watch the Baba train go by the Baba racing uh, Mad Croc team as the Celio down to 15th We just saw his teammate Philip Roms in the 16th position as we take a look at Marit Stromoy again, she needs to figure out a way. Right now, she's down about seven-tenths of a second. That's a long way here, Jonathan. She's got to make up to get to Benevente. Torrente just went to the top with a 52.9. And obviously, the uh, problem that he had with his engine has been squared away nicely right now. But right now, all eyes focused on this woman from Norway who does a tremendous job in promoting not only herself, but her race team. And uh, they use a two-boat, uh, seated boat, as they use a, a wonderful uh, promotional vehicle. They used it last week in uh, Norway, and they gave uh, hundreds of rides, promoting the sport. Hats off to her. Come through with another lap there. Stromoy still in 13th position, Steve, going for another lap again. She's going to have to start putting some pressure now. Really go for it. Take a bit of a chance, because she desperately needs to get it into the next session, because moving up the grid means so much on the uh, start of the Grand Prix tomorrow. Two minutes, 20 seconds to go. Q1, we're glad you're with us today. 22nd Grand Prix of France. Today is qualifying day. Steve Michael, Jonathan Jones with you here along Love Lac Lamar as we are here along the uh, south shore of Lake Geneva, or Lac Lamar as the French call it here. A beautiful, beautiful setting. Wonderful day. Temperature up uh, uh, well above 30 degrees here. We expect it to be even warmer tomorrow. And look at the battle there. You can see Sami Celio trying to settle the boat, trying to come out of the corner, looking for a clear lane. He's running out of time. Celio down in the 16th spot is starting to get desperate for this two-time world champion. And Jonathan, oh no, the hood's coming up. The engine sounds sour. Looks like Celio's heading in. And it looks like from our vantage point, Jonathan, the way it sounded, he is done for the afternoon. What a shame for a man. We thought it was starting to build momentum. It's going backwards on him in a hurry. Yeah, like you said, Steve, that engine didn't sound particularly good, and he's come to a drive Halt. Whether it was the engine or maybe some other technical thing on the boat, we, we, we don't know. As we come back again to uh, to Marit there, still going for it, still in that 14th position. A little better at the moment, the water, I think, although it's easy for me to say that sitting here, Steve. But uh, she looks like she's carrying a bit more pace there. Let's, let's follow her through this lap, Steve, and see if she can move up. Stromoy a year ago showed a lot of drama. She came up, she almost got in the top uh, six for Q3. She qualified seventh a year ago, seventh again as we see her come by. Did she move up? Did she go any faster? And she does as she charges herself up into that four spot. Wow, Jonathan, did she find some time? She laid down a 54 2 1. And for her, safely sliding in here with 35 seconds remaining. What a great run for her. Yeah, that, that was a good performance there. She's been going round and round and round, checking what the water conditions are like just to be able to set that boat up. And, and fair play to Stromae. That's a great position for her to be in. Benevente's dropped down three spots. And this man, Pinamara, needs something here. Will he get it done? Will he get back up into the top 12? He did not. So the man who qualified... Last uh, race in the fourth spot, his best career pole position as you look at Philip Roms. Roms trying his best, but remember, Morass still has one more lap, Jonathan. Checkered flag comes out. Anybody who's still on the course in race trim still has one more circuit to come around. And let's see if this happens. There you can see uh, the driver 
from France as he works his way through. Can Peter Brown figure out a way to get and join his father into Q2 as we hold our breath, Jonathan? It looks like he's, he's carrying some pretty good speed as he goes down there, Steve, into turn number five. This is the tricky bit that I was talking about earlier on. Round number five into number six. Good corner there. The way he's going at the moment, I expect him to move as he almost loses control, Steve, as he comes down past the line. And he comes across the line, and Peter Moran moves up to number one. Wow, was that fantastic. A 51.56. Hello, welcome to Q2, <laughs> Mr. Peter Moran. That was a good performance. You could see that he, he had only a matter of seconds to get up there, and he really did put the hammer down there for that lap. And it goes to show, Stephen, you can see the, the team CTIC China, they're pretty happy. Fanny, his wife on the left, she's excited. She's got big smiles. There's Eric Chan, who's the team director, and then, of course, uh, Philippe Desertin, who is the race director. And boy, big smiles on their face. They felt tension like we did, like, oh my, this could be a disaster, but instead, hello, number one. Yeah, I know, fair play. And you know, the thing is, Steve, it just, what you've got to do is you've just got to get the boat balanced on the water. And by that, it means moving weight in the boat, distributing the weight correctly. And if you can get that weight fairly, fairly up the front of the boat, you know, um, then it, it does help tremendously. Having said that, too much weight then, and of course the boat will nosedive. So it is a fine balance. Jonathan, a huge surprise. There you see the boat number one. That's Alice Corella, four-time world champion. Jonathan, he's qualified in the pole the last two years in a row. The first time here, he qualified third, he won the race, and then was disqualified. He's won the last two races in a row. There is your four-time world champion and race director for the victory team, Scott Gilman from the USA. He's got to be pulling his hair out going, what happened? We got 13th, and we missed it by two one-hundredths of a second. Corella changing boats, Jonathan. It did not pay off for him. No, I mean, he switched to the Baba boat. Uh, the victory team actually built their own boats in uh, in Dubai in the Middle East and uh, unfortunately they had some damage on his boat uh, in London a couple of weekends ago and uh, it was just too much damage to repair and they in fact they're going to build him a brand new boat for for the next race that we have in China but uh, no, he, he, this morning he hardly put any laps at all out there. And I mean, that's definitely hurting him because, you know, he had very little set of time. And uh, boy, we haven't seen uh, Carella down in that position, Steve, for, well, how long? It's been a long, long time, Jonathan. I'll uh, rewind the record books here, but I'll tell you something. You know, he qualified third in Portimao. He qualified third in London. And boy, today, as you mentioned, losing that number one boat that he was still uh, fighting with but yet was making good results in qualifying it didn't pay off for him and now he's gonna have to dig himself up uh, with a lot of momentum tomorrow he's gonna start way in the back of the pack here yeah and that's gonna be a tough call especially when he's not been in this boat now I said to him well you're fairly familiar with the Baba boat you used to run it he said I haven't run a boat like that since 2009 he said I've been running DSCs ever since and of course he was with DSC last year he decided that he fancied a change after being with them for a long time switched to the victory team and uh, so far oh, I wonder what, what he's thinking as he uh, comes into the uh, the pontoon in that uh, 13th position yeah as you watch a few Benetton sailboats working their way back in while we have a brief six minute pause here we take a look let's go back and take a look at the results there's a lot of surprises here Starting off with the man who got the fast time, 51.56. Uh, Peter Moran was on his way out the door when he came across with 14 seconds left to run. He got one extra lap and he put himself squarely in that number one spot through Q1. Sean Torrente, he was struggling. He was struggling on the dock for the first 10 minutes until he got out. He finished second quick. Then his teammate, his new teammate, Eric Stark, a good uh, about a second back. But anyway, he did just enough to get in and that's all you want to do. Philippe Shep, of course giving that CTIC China team the 1-4 effect in Q1. And Philip Roms, how about Philip Roms coming out of nowhere? We thought he was dead in the water, and boy, he just charged his way up in the last lap to put himself in, and a great run. Francesco Catando running uh, a square Q1 performance. Marit Stromoy, she was down in 13th until she charged her way up to move on to Q2. And Bartek Marzouak, the driver, running steady progress. He didn't get a chance to start the last race, and he's going to move on to Q2. Eric Edden, of course, he went to Q3 for the first time in his career. This is only his third start. And Ahmed Al-Hamli got in there just by the skin of his teeth. 
So the victory team has uh, one driver going on, and Alex Corral. These are all the disappointing uh, names here. Look at Corella. He's a four-time world champion. He's not moving on. You look down, you see Sami Selio. He's a two-time world champion, and he is not moving on. So uh, a bit of a surprise in the back of the field, and uh, Shimona Schuft from Germany rounding out our field of drivers here this afternoon. So uh, a bit of a surprise. We always get that in Q1, Jonathan. When you least expect it, you see big names dropping out, not moving on. Yeah, and you could see that for some of these really short boats, which are going to, I mean, they'll have a big advantage when we move to China for the next two Grand Prix, because there you're running on very, very slick, flat water. Um, but I would say, if looking at the performance of the boats today and the type of boats that these guys are running, that, uh, you know, maybe Chap and uh, his son-in-law, Moran, you know, they are running boats which are slightly longer than some of these really short sprint boats that have been run here. And uh, does it look like they're in pretty good shape for the, for the event tomorrow? That may always be the secret, Jonathan. Bigger boats on this big water. All eyes this weekend will be on the Maverick uh, French team. And the lead driver is Cedric Deguin. How does he like uh, racing here and handling the pressure of being a Frenchman in a French Grand Prix? It's my country. I race a lot here, and this is the first way that I met uh, in F1 uh, four years ago. And uh, three years ago, I finished uh, in the fourth position in this race with a little chance for sure. But uh, I love this circuit. We are the lonely French completely team. For this year, we have a, a new uh, teammate, which is not French, but everybody inside the team is, uh, is French. For us, it's an important date. Uh, we have to, to make a good thing in, uh, in this race for the, for the future. Interesting numbers, Jonathan, and numbers tell stories. Now, two years ago, Cedric Deguin qualified where he did today, way down in 17th spot, and he ended up finishing fourth in the race. So it'll be interesting to see if he can charge his way toward the front. Cedric Deguin, as we mentioned, one of a couple of drivers who are second generation. As a matter of fact, his father today is on the public re, uh, public uh, announce system and he is talking play by play to all the uh, french uh, speaking people who surround evian in france so it's kind of fun to have his father there promoting the race as well he's an ex formula one driver yeah and it's important obviously to do well on your home ground for a number of reasons first of all of course you're french but secondly they bring a lot of potential sponsors along to these races steve and uh, you know if they want to carry on for the rest of the eight they do need that funding well last year's runner-up for rookie of the year trophy that was grant trask of australia had three top 10 finishes with his only hiccup coming uh, here when he crashed out of the event we had a chance to ask him about last year's weekend overall and what he thinks about the venue here you know, we had a good bounce back in the race and managed to get in the sixth spot. We pushed very hard and came close a few times to going for a swim, but, you know, we pushed hard and ended up with some points on the board, which was good. Yeah, last year was actually our best qualifying session over here. We qualified fifth, but um, unfortunately I come unstuck in the race and hit a roller and nosedived it, you know. I like this course here. The water can be very tricky, but it's also a fun course. Well, it's not fun for him right now, Jonathan, because he is uh, down uh, currently uh, looking at starting 12th tomorrow. He didn't make it into queue uh, number two. And uh, actually, uh, with him, let's uh, let's look at this again. No, Jonathan, he was able to do it. Yeah. Excuse me. He was able to be the last person to get in to Q2. So hats off to Grant Trask. Sorry, Grant. We'll keep an eye on you this time through yeah. Q2 and see if we can do, buddy. See if we can get you into Q3. Yeah. Now, this is where they really have to start trying. This is where they have to take chances, Steve. We know that water conditions are tricky, but... Getting into that top six means so much for the Grand Prix tomorrow. If you can get pole position here, that is going to be a big plus because when you get into the first turn off the pontoon, it means nobody can come across you. You're going to get clean water and you'll need that out on this circuit because, you know, it's going to be a tough one. It's going to be a rock and roll ride out there for these drivers for the Grand Prix of France tomorrow. No doubt about that. Well, we've had about five minutes to have the water calm down just a bit. We'll see if uh, immediately they come out. The driver's out in front, see if they'll try to set that fast lap right off the bat or whether they'll continue to wait. Uh, of course, we're talking about, uh, you know, Jonathan, 15 minutes rather than 20 minutes. So everything gets uh, accordioned in and squeezed in. The pressure starts to build here. Yeah, can Tando now see Steve? 
taking advantage there, others kept napping a bit. Are they going to just let him go and see what the conditions are like when he runs, first of all? Or have they just been caught out a little bit? Cantando, no question. If he can go for it, he will. Uh, but he's not pushing too hard, Steve, there. You can see conditions. Re have they improved? Maybe slightly, but not a lot. Yeah, it's hard to tell. It doesn't really look like there's a remarkable difference between what we saw at the end of Q1 and now just the start of Q2 as we get the green flag and the clock starts and underway and we watch Catando. Boy, look at that air out the boat. Oh my, that was pretty dramatic there. Yeah, the other thing you see is the fact that he's running on this water. He has no idea what the conditions are like for the first lap. So we, he normally, uh, these drivers take the first lap as what we call a sighting lap, which means they get out there. Big difference between uh, Formula One powerboat racing and Formula One car racing, of course, is the fact that the cars are just running on flat, uh, flat water all the time. Uh, these drivers are running on what is probably like a Formula One car running on a ploughed field. Absolutely. You can imagine how rough it is out there. So there's a lot going on in that cockpit, trying to get the boat to settle on the water and trying to, at the same time, not have too much of the boat in the water to create drag and then move speed. Yeah, years ago, Nicky Lauda, who was multi-time world champion in Formula One auto racing, hopped into a boat and he said the exact same thing, Jonathan. Said, oh boy, he said, this is really wild. Because car racing, you know what's happening lap after lap. You know the pavement here. You could fall into a hole and end your day in Catan is pushing hard right now. Eric Eden has got the fast time so far with a 57.5 now. Again, a sighting lap here. And uh, Catando right now is trying to work his way up. He's uh, currently now coming around. He's going to do his best to get in a quick time here. Yeah, watch out for Eden this weekend. He's a young, uh, really exciting uh, Swedish driver. Um, he's obviously running with Jonas Anderson, who's got a tremendous amount of experience and is really guiding him uh, in the first season of Formula One, as we see there. Peter Moran that uh, got the quickest time last time, but uh, it's a bit of luck. Oh, you can see how rough it is there between turn number five and number 60. It's got a handful as he tries to get down, coming down past the start line as he improved. Well, he's up to six. Yeah. Anyway, so what we're saying here is Eden just set a fast time with a 57.59. Contando threw himself up into the second spot, but right now he's sliding fast. Look at he's four seconds off of what uh, Stark just laid down. Stark did a 55.09. Hello, Mr. Stark. We're glad you're with us today. And that was a good time for him because, uh, tell you what, there's a bit of pressure. Let's talk about what Eric Stark is going through here, Jonathan, because this is his very first race with Team Abu Dhabi. He's got a lot to learn. He's got a lot to uh, understand with his mechanics. It's a whole different language. And it's not easy betting into a new team right off the bat, is it? No, there's a lot of pressure on him because he wants to do well. He now knows he's got probably the best equipment out there. And obviously, uh, you know, he, he wants to utilize that equipment as best he can. But let's, let's be honest, Steve. We saw Stark run in London a couple of weeks ago. It was a tough circuit there, very, very rough. And he just dominated that event. There was nobody that got got anywhere near him. I was saying that, I mean, I know that uh, 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 Philippe Chiap, who's second at the moment, he was pushing him fairly closely, but, but Stark had such a beautifully balanced boat. And he was telling me, Steve, that the boat that he's running here with DSC now is almost identical to the boat that he ran in London. The only thing he changed was he changed the seat because he's got a molded seat in, in his own boat and he's popped that into the, the DSC that he's running this weekend here. And I, I understand he's also running with his own propellers at the moment because he feels comfortable with those he's been developing them so he's not using the DSC props as I understand and uh, so far so good for Stark he's coming away from that win in London and uh, right up at the sharp end again here in France all right as we go on board with Eric Stark in his fifth season for this driver who is starting his 28th race he's got uh, two wins He's got three pole positions, and for him, he is uh, hoping to carry on the tradition of great Swedish drivers that have been around uh, so many, many years. This is our 35th year of uh, UIM Formula One World Championship racing, and the Swedes have come on strong. It's a great tradition for the Nordics to do so well, and we saw that earlier last year, Jonathan, where we had uh, the Swedes up in the top three, and uh, I'll tell you something, Eric Stark could be the new burgeoning star here. He's on a roll. Yeah. We go back on board with him. You can see how rough it is. Jonathan, it looks flat, but boy, it sure isn't. There's a lot of holes out there. Oh, there is. And what we've got, like I said earlier, you've got these rollers, and there's, there's a certain gap between the rollers. And if you've got one of these shorter boats, rather than go 
going from the top of his roller, you're sinking into them, and, and that does cause a problem. But I wouldn't be doing too much at the moment, Steve, if I was him. He's, he's 2.49 seconds ahead of uh, Chap in second position at the moment, so he doesn't want to take any chances unless he needs to. There's his father. Uh, he was telling me that his father's always been really interested in telemetry and that sort of thing, and they had a really good system when they ran on their own. But he was saying that now that they've moved to the Abu Dhabi team, I mean, they're on another level, he said. And he said, just all the information that they gain from the, the performance of the engine, the performance of the boat, helps him so much in just getting that boat dialed in, you know, for the race. Yeah, and they really eat that up, too, as you mentioned. He just loves delving into the numbers of what's going on as we uh, continue to watch now, as we come through. You get a chance to watch, uh, looks like Bartak Marzwak out there. And here we shift our attention to the number three machine. And that's Ahmed Al Hamli. He's just hanging out. He's about a tenth of a second off from getting into Q3 and get a run for the pole. But he's going to have to push a little bit harder. And uh, he did uh, his best he could here. And he's down to eighth. Torrente has slid down to six spots. So here we go again with a driver from Florida. He could put on all the dramatics in Q2. Yeah, he better watch himself because we saw Peter Aram there, you know, the uh, the team CTIC China uh, boat earlier on. In that last session, he was way off and bang, he was the quickest guy out there. He's four seconds off at the moment, so Torrente has got to watch his back very, very carefully. Otherwise, he won't get into the top six. 2015, we were watching this man going for a run to get into Q3 at the same time here in Q2. And he blew the boat over spectacularly three times around as he now has moved himself up into the top six. Torrente sliding down to the seventh spot with just over eight minutes to go. But you remember the dramatics that they had when he blew the boat over and he took his teammate Eric Stark about the same time. They both failed to go to Q3. So Ahmed El Hamli always dramatic when it comes to qualifying. As we said, he's got 10 pole positions for his career. Yeah, and he's having a really hard ride out there as uh, as we see the uh, Philip Roms now. You know, this again, quite a long boat, as we said. Not so wide in the tunnel. You can see the boat running quite well as he, he just needs to... As soon as you take your foot off, Steve, what happens is that the boat starts rocking from back to front and it alters the handling. What you've got to do is you've got to keep that throttle be very, very easy on the throttle. Go at three-quarter throttle rather than flat out and then take your foot off. And if you can do that, you can keep the boat on top of these waves, which should give you, in, in, in theory anyway, I think it should give you a pretty good time. All right, let's see what he does as he comes through. Currently in 10th place, did he move up? He was five seconds off the lead. He does. He moves up one position. He just shaved off a second point eight, but he's still in ninth spot. Now, Torrente had moved down to the, about the eighth position. He jumped up to the fifth spot. Peter Moran found himself up in the top six and he's dropped down two spots so it continues the shuffle as we go along here jonathan with just a shade over seven minutes left to go in this 15 minute session we're past the halfway point here top six only go for the pole position for tomorrow's 22nd grand prix of france yeah, just seen torrente go through there and then philip roms come on philip keep your foot down keep you can see just how the boat's bouncing steve what he needs to do is just trim it in a little bit, run it a bit more on its nose, not too much. And you can see there then, at least he'll get some stability in the boat, which will allow him to run. Don't over trim it, just that looks a good run there, but whether it's going to be enough, we'll just have to see as he comes round again. Boy, they're having a hard time out there today. All right, we'll keep an eye on him as he comes through. This is his seventh season. And Rom's did. He went a little faster. He moved up into the fifth position. So at the moment with six minutes and now 15 seconds left, he is currently right there in the top six. That's what you need to do. Torrente now desperately trying to hang on to the sixth place position as we look at Bartek Marzowak, the driver out of Poland who's down in the tenth position. Torrente now down to seven, Steve. My right. goodness, the pressure's on him with five minutes to go. All right, as we watch uh, Bartak Marzowak, and he, of course, he is the teammate of Marit Stromoy. Stromoy down in the 12th spot. Let's see what she does. She moves up into the seventh position. She's just a shade out now, Jonathan. Two tenths of a second back. But Bartak, as you uh, take a look at his uh, uh, radio person as she tries to fill in, and Bartak Marzwak trying to do his best 
to get going here, Jonathan. Exciting stuff. I can see Ed in there. He was on the back foot. Now he's back up into fourth. The boat handling very well. Changing every second for the last five minutes. You can see Al Hamley now up into six. Cantando back to six. Wow. This is probably one of the best qualifying sessions that we've had this year so far. Back and forth they go. Remember Cantando, 2.35 seconds. He's ahead by two tenths of a second to Al Hamley. And that number three, Catando now slides down to the seventh spot. He's lost his position. Eric Eden now up in the top six. He's just a shade under two seconds from Eric Stark, who set the fast time so far of a 52.96. So it's Stark and Torrente and Shep in the top three, but we still got a long way to go, Jonathan. Four minutes and 43 seconds to go here in Q2. Yeah, and it's basically the guy that's brave enough to keep that boat on the top of the water, trim it just nicely, don't overdrive the boat, be gentle on the throttle, and if you can do that, I think you're going to get into the top six. But Chiap now moves up into the top slot, Sark in second, Torrente down to third. First sub, 53 second lap we've seen this afternoon in qualifying. Here in Q2, Catando pushing, we just saw his crew earning him and pushing him along here he's down in that eighth spot he needs to figure out to get another half second as you look at eric edden who is then sitting there desperately trying to claw his way up and figure out two tenths of a second for this rookie driver out of sweden great driver in formula two excelled there incredibly well he's young he's aggressive He's got a good mentor with uh, Jonas Anderson there, and the boat's looking pretty solid as he comes down. The, here he comes, Steve, down past the start finish line. Is he going to do it? All right, let's find out as he comes by. And yep. Eric Hedden uh, kicks himself up into the fourth spot, Jonathan. He went up five positions and slid himself up. Now he's sitting there just behind Torrente. Torrente now two seconds almost behind uh, Eric Stark who did a 51-5-1. Wow, Jonathan, that's the fast time that we've seen all day so far in qualifying. Yeah, Stark's on the money, no doubt about it. 1.31 ahead of Chiap, but Chiap not, certainly not showing up exactly what he can do out there at the moment. Torrente sitting pretty in third. But Ed, a fantastic performance from this, uh, from this young uh, Swedish driver. He looks solid out there, Steve, as he goes around the circuit. All right, as we watch him coming through now down toward turn number six. This has been all sorts of problems in the past, the history of this race. Down in five and six as Eric Eden comes by in that fifth spot. Let's see if he moves up any farther as he dug himself up. He did. He went up to fourth. Stromoy now up into the fifth spot. As we now hold our breath, and Thani Alquimze, who is the uh, driver from uh, Team Abu Dhabi, and for Alquimze, he is doing his best to try to improve. He's second in this championship with 24 points as we shift our attention back to Peter Morat. Fifth in the championship, got his first ever podium in London. He qualified fourth and finished third. And he's down in tenth at the moment, Steve. Uh, but we know that he's capable. Let's let's keep the camera on him if we can. He's coming down past the start finish line here. Is he going to do it? No, but I think he's on a fast lap at the moment. Boat looks well balanced on the water. We can see there running some good top speed, about 135 miles an hour as he goes sailing down into turn number one, number two. Oh, he gets a little bit of traffic there. You could just see on the outside of him, but it looks as though he's got that clear water and he's going well. All right, we'll keep an eye on him now as he comes whistling by as he works his way through. Let's see what he does here. As um, we look just out in front, he comes down and he fights his way around this circuit. Catando in the seventh spot, he just goes by us now. Can Catando move up? And Catando does! He goes to the second spot! As Torrente slides to third, Philip Rahm's coming by. Rahm's down in that 12th spot as we look at uh, Peter Morat. He comes out at turn number six. We'll see what he can do here as he comes by. Can he improve? Can he move up? And he's down in the 11th position, and he fights his way up to eight. He's not there yet, Jonathan. No, but he's on another blinding lap. He came down past the start-finish line there. The boat looked well-balanced on the water. Watch out for Moran, but uh, at the moment, Cantando in that second. Wow, that's a great performance from the... Uh from the Italian driver, no Cat question about Catano it. Catano in his 170 second start, and boy, he looks great here in qualifying. Coming by as the time whittles down, less than a minute to go. Every second will count now as we watch Peter Moran as he works his way through. He's got one last opportunity, maybe two, Jonathan, but I don't think so. No, Steve, he's looking good here. He's into the last but one turn, boy. 
Hooks the boat there, out of the last turn, boy. Is he going to do it? Well, let's find out as he comes by. Can he move up into the top six for the second time in two races? Peter Moran comes through. He does. He goes to the fifth spot, Jonathan. Pushing his father-in-law down. And now he slides down to the sixth spot. As uh, Marit Stromoy pushing hard. Down to ten seconds to go. The action continues. Is Ahmed al Hamli going to make his way now? As we watch the final boats come through, Eric Stark in that number one spot. And Eric Eden, did he get in? Did he force Peter Moran down? The checkered flag has come out. Stark Marcel number Steve one. Steve is up to second. Wow, what a run there from that guy, Polish driver. Bartek Marzalak moving up into the second spot. Katando sliding down into third. Thaniel Quimsy in that fourth position. Torrente hung on to the top five. And Philippe Schnapp, tell you what, got into the top six. Peter Moran didn't make it. Well, I'll tell you what, what not bad for a driver, though, who is sitting around in his third career start. He made it exciting. We followed him all the way around, Jonathan. As you can see, uh, the drivers coming through. Thaniel Quimsy doing well. So as you take a look, you got Stark in that number one spot. Marit Stromoy slid all the way up. She got herself into that fourth spot. And Katanda, who was in second briefly with about 10 seconds to go, <laughs> slid all the way down to fifth, but he's in. And Sean Torrente did not get in. Wow, that he is lost, a shock. He lost about three positions. In the last 30 seconds, and now there's uh, the Team Abu Dhabi people, but there's uh, multi-time world champion Guido Capolini looking on. Boy, that is a big surprise there because uh, they thought maybe he would get in. But he lost, Jonathan, by one one-hundredth of a second. Daniel Quimsey got in, Catando got up into that fifth position, and Reid Strumoy charged up to fourth. Steve, and you know, it's not over till it's over, is it? That's for sure. Because we have never, with, what, ten seconds to go, we had Catando in sec second position. And literally in the last 13 seconds, in fact, it was, he went down to fifth, and the positions were changing all the time, which means that you need to be out there all the time. You know, you can't afford to just sit back and wait and... Uh, Bit of a shock there for Torrente because he looked really good earlier on, and I, I thought he would definitely get into the top six. But uh, look tell at his what... frustration, Jonathan. Sorry to interrupt you, but you can see he's just oh, yeah, he's yeah. shaking his head. He goes, "What happened? I thought I was in. It didn't happen for him." And the worst thing is by whispering to him and go, "You missed it by one one hundredth of a second. Look at you can see how dis. Hey. He's sitting there going, "Come on, Steve. He's obviously not happy with somebody there. So it it, it can only be feedback." Because when you think about it, he's obviously out there. He's, he's, he's reliant on the guys on the radio to tell him where he is and how well he's doing. And uh, he's not at all happy there with that performance. And, and a little bit of pressure maybe ooh, as he low, slams down the, uh, the, the top of the, uh, uh, of the bolt there. And a little bit of pressure on him because, you know, the guy that's just turned up at the team, Eric Stark, He's in that lead position at the moment and, and looking very, very strong. And uh, Torrente, yeah, may, I don't think he feels that it's his fault, maybe. Um, I don't know. But he, for him to have got out of the boat and say, come on, it means that something somewhere does not add up. Well, Sean Torrente uh, visibly disappointed. But you know something, Jonathan, for all the people who cheer him on last year, he qualified 15th. He had a terrible day, didn't even get out of Q1. He charged his way up and finished on the podium in third. And then two years ago, he was uh, on the podium. His worst performance in this race is fourth. So we'll see how he does on race day. But bitterly disappointed he is. As you said, he dropped, he literally dropped four positions in the last 15 seconds. Yeah, maybe it'll be different here. But what we tend to find is a bit of a trend as in Formula One car racing. You get that pole position and it just gives you an enormous advantage. The only big thing here, Steve, is, as we've said, the water conditions have been so unpredictable. And, you know, tomorrow it's probably not going to be any different because the wind today is pretty much the same as the wind tomorrow. So uh, it'll all be down to a lot of the traffic that's out there um, on, on the lake. And, uh, you know, it's, so he may have a second uh, bite of the cherry tomorrow. Maybe he can get the boat set up well and uh, who knows. But I've got to say, what, Steve, Bartek Marsalak. He was w way, way, way down there and uh, didn't seem to be uh, making much in the way of improvement. And then 
with about 10 seconds to go to the end of the session, up to second. I mean, he didn't even compete in the race in London, so he's got to be well chuffed. Yeah, it was a great run for him. We uh, pretty much forgot about him because he hadn't yeah. made any progress in about uh, 13 of those 15 minutes, and all of a sudden, bang, he went right to the number two spot. Congratulations for the man out of pole. Let's take a look at the full results here as we take a look at Q2, 15 minutes of excitement and it's only going to ratch up now here as we go on to q3 so eric stark did a sub 52 second lap a 5151 very impressive for the first time he's in that boat and with the new team bartek marswak again we just talked about how wonderful he did philippe shep kind of hanging around down in third spot He's uh, willing to pick up championship points if he can get them. He's never finished a race here. Marit Strumley, great run. She came all the way up to fourth at the very last. Francesco Catando was like falling bricks. He was up to number two. He fell down to fifth. But more importantly, he made it to the top six shootout. Thaniel Quimsey got in in the sixth spot. Here are the drivers who uh, left in tears. Sean Torrente dropped out of the top six in a hurry in that last few seconds. Uh, Peter Moran thought maybe he had a great shot at it. Eric uh, Eden, you can see the difference in uh, the times between uh, Moran and Eden. Ahmed Alhamli, 10th. Grant Trask into Q2, finished uh, in that 11th spot, and then Philip Roms in the 12th position. So there you go. Pretty exciting so far. Yeah, very exciting. And I'll tell exciting. you something. It's great now to uh, think about uh, this man as uh, Francesco Catando, the Italian, has seen about every condition, Jonathan, in a race circuit, and he can deliver in his past 22 years. By the way, what does he think of the challenge here at uh, Lac Le Mans this weekend? Uh, you know, this is a, a race against the lake, not against other people. So, I mean, let's see what the lake wants to do. Uh, he's the boss, and uh, <laughs> that's it. I mean, you know, uh, we can have a very nice, smooth uh, r uh, race, and that uh, means uh, uh, competitive from a uh, point of view between drivers, and uh, we can have a very rough one, and then it's more a challenge on yourself. Ciao. Well, he's been chowing for many years, my friend. I'll tell you something. His first race in China back in 1996. At one time, Francesco Catanda, believe it or not, was uh, studying to be a lawyer, was in law school, and uh, decided to focus in on his racing career. It's a family affair for everybody with the Blaze Formula One team. Currently down in 12th position now. He came out like gangbusters early in his career, Jonathan. Two runners up in the championship. He's had four career pole positions going for his fifth today. He had 12 wins and for him, it's gone 27 races since he last uh, won a race. And uh, for him to finish races, it's important because he's only finished three of his last 11 starts. So hats off to uh, Catando. Let's see if he can finish off the uh, race weekend. Yeah, I think maybe these tough conditions are going to be playing into his hands this weekend, Steve. What do you what do you think on that? Yeah, we saw him, remember, a year ago. He was really tough, and he was down in the far corner, remember? It looked like he had a real chance at uh, coming up and uh, moving on and getting in a top three uh, performance. And he had bad luck at the end. And now to start things off. Q3 is underway. The battle for the pole. The shootout now as we focus in here on Lac Lamar. It's go time. This will be a gripping battle, Jonathan, as we watch Thaniel Quimsey coming out. The driver currently in this championship, sitting in the number two spot. I'll tell you what, he hasn't been uh, somebody who's been dramatic in, in his play this year. He's been steady, he's been constant. Thaniel Quimsey kind of laying back, but I'll tell you something, he's got 24 points. He's three points out of first in his 17th year. Portimao, he finished second after qualifying second. London, he charged up the fourth, Jonathan, and he's underway. I can a bad run there from Thaniel Quimsey. Both looking good. The water's obviously settled down a little bit. Uh, having said that, it's easy for me to say that's sitting here, but uh, the boat looks pretty good, and uh, Thani will definitely give it his all. He has no fear, this driver from Abu Dhabi, and uh, he's put up some blinding performances in rough water before, so uh, let's just see how he's going to get on. All right, Thaniel Quimsey now sliding out, heading toward the right-hander as he works his way down. 460 meters, clips it, now heads down 450 meters into turn number five. This is where all the dramatics happen, right here, Jonathan. Yeah, he's just come around there, looking not too bad. Had to take a pretty wide line, mind. If the conditions were calm, he, would, he's, he wouldn't have been uh, quite so wide as that, coming down past the start-finish line for his first lap. All right, let's get the time as he comes whistling by. A 51-4-6 for Thaniel Quimsey, the driver out of Abu Dhabi, going for lap number two. 
pretty good, but I don't think that's going to be fast enough. And he looks as though he knows that. Uh, I'm sure that his crew chief on the radio to him has said, you know, it's not a bad lap, but uh, I think you're going to have to do a little bit better. And pole position, like I've said before, is crucial here. You notice the latest DAC is, as you can see, the red stripe there um, uh, on the nose of the boat there. What they've done is they've put a, a number of fins going up there, which channel the air into the engine to give probably more horsepower, but at the same time, just giving a bit more balance on the boat, especially in these rough conditions. Yeah, as he slides out of turn number six, that was two seconds, by the way, down from his practice time, but those conditions were different. Let's see what he gets as he goes faster than a 51.46. Daniel Quincy, 52.12, so 51.46 in the record books. As you see, Guido Capolini calmly uh, keeping an eye on one of his uh, two drivers out of the three that will be here in Q3. Yeah, he really, it is very much a guessing game here, you know, it's it's a case of a little bit of luck if you not get it, get involved with any rollers, but I did think that uh, Thani was able to run just a little bit better, the whistle goes, and uh, next boat out is Cantando now, let's just see how he gets on, he's not been in a position like this for some time. Francesco Cantando has four career pole positions, this as we mentioned, his 172nd race start, he ties the all-time mark today, if he can get into the race tomorrow with uh, Guido Capolini. And uh, this is a big, big day for this uh, 22nd uh, season of racing for this man who's 42 years old, makes his home in Milan, Italy. Francesco Cattando dedicated himself and his family to building boats their own way and that's exactly how it's panning out for him now maybe he could have had a couple of world championships had he stayed with the norm but he decided to go a different direction jonathan and let's see what happens here yeah that has definitely cost him uh, in, in the last number of years but you know maybe he feels that this boat is certainly making some solid progress and he feels that he may be able to uh, you know, fight for that championship, if not this year, the next as he goes down past the start finish line, carrying some pretty good speed there. Look how the boat's running on top of the water. You can see the back end, as I call it, of the boat, fairly solid as he comes down into turn number two there. Let's see how he takes two and three. Not bad through two, Steve, keeping the boat on top of the water, pulling some good RPM, good acceleration there as the boat bounces from side to side. Look at the amount of air that's running in the tunnel. That's the area between, oh, and it's rocking back and forth there as he comes down now to the right-hander. Let's see how he's going to get through that. As he works his way down, he comes down 450 meters into turn number five. Francesco Cattando from Milan, Italy, has not gotten the pole, Jonathan, since 2010 in Portugal. And as he slides out of the final turn, airs the boat out, riding it's on its heels. Let's see what he does. Can he improve on a 51.46? Will he go to the top? He does not. He does a 51.97, which is just about a half a second slower than Thani Alquimzi, just showing you how the conditions are playing havoc with these drivers right now. And he's driving his socks off as he throws it again into number two there, around into number three. Doesn't seem to be carrying quite as much speed as he did on, on the last lap there, but still going for it. And boy, he's certainly not frightened to, to, to hang that boat out in these really tough conditions. This man has earned 926 seven and a half points in the 22 years that he's raced and as he comes through his best season was 2000 when he finished just two points behind scott gilman for the world title francesco Catando, is it back from the future from this man is he going to go to the number one spot he'll come across the line and he does as he whistles through a 52 28 so just like thani alquimsey a little bit slower on the second lap right now second in the order yeah, you see on the first lap, they can take a nice wide line through number five and six and then straighten up. So they've got, they're carrying more speed as they come down past that start finish line. And that is an advantage. But he felt that maybe he couldn't take that chance because the second maybe would not have been as fast as the first. So anyway, solid position, 0.51 off that uh, time of uh, Alquamsi at the moment. And now we have our lady driver, Marit Stromoy. Been in the doldrums for a little while, but showing good here this weekend. Well, Marit Stromoy, who started her career in Doha back in 2007, she got her first pole, as we talked earlier, back in 
Portimao in 2011. She has one career victory back in 2050, that in Sharjah. And for Marit Stromoy, this is only the ninth time, Jonathan, in her career she's gone to Q3. Yep. So let's see what she can do here. When she did it one time, of course, she went to number one. Let's see what she can get a chance to as she sights herself up on this first uh, of uh, getting herself squared away and down into Q. Uh, yeah number three and nice, number one. Nice wide line there now, Steve, floating the boat, keeping it on top of the water. Conditions look as though they are getting that little bit better. Oh, bit of a twitch there. She comes down past the start finish line. All right, and she heads down and long straight away here at 590 meters into turn number two. Yeah, looks good, looks good. Look at the way that the boat is. You can see the speed there. We've got the, uh, the, uh, the camera that we have on our aircraft, which is shining down there, giving people a good idea as to what the conditions are like and the sort of speed that these boats are running accelerating out of number three there down that 450 460 meter uh, straight coming to the yellow a little bit difficult again one of those rollers there slowing her pace a little bit all right as she slides out of that right hander this on a 2.08 kilometer 1.29 mile circuit red strumoy the driver out of norway looking for her second career pole position out of turn number six Taking it wide, Jonathan. Let's see what she sacrifices lap one, or does she go to the top? Let's find out. As she races through, she goes third quick as well. 55-01. This is going to be the one, Jonathan, that she's going to have to pull it out and really show herself if she wants any chance at pole now. Well, she's had a sighting lap, so the first lap, she knows what the, uh, where the difficult conditions are on the water for the second lap. Coming around there again, down past number two, number three. Let's see, she had a bit of difficulty coming down this straight now on the last lap, but the boat at the moment looking fairly solidly planted on the water. Coming a little bit wide as she goes around the right under there, Steve. I would have kept it just a bit tighter if I, if I could have, and if I was in the boat maybe. And then down, water conditions definitely getting better, so she should in theory, be able to improve on that time. This is the lap she was looking for. Let's see if this Baba boat from Italy can bring her home to number one. Marit Stromoy out of Norway, hoping to go from third to first. She comes across the line, does a 5-3-3-6. Jonathan, that will not get her any place but third at the moment. And Marit Stromoy tried her darndest, but it just didn't find the magic she was looking for. And she sits in that third spot currently up. And then Philippe Shep coming up next. Yeah, this is a, an important race for Philippe Chap because obviously coming from France, having had a lot of bad luck, I believe, Steve, in the past year, um, when he was running very, very fast, he had a few gremlins that sat in. We're going on board with Philippe for this lap, so that'll give uh, people a good idea as to the sort of buffeting and the water conditions that he has to put up with here in France. Philippe Chap began his career in Sharjah back in 2002, Jonathan, it took him 12 years to get his first pole position. And he did that, of course, uh, as he got it in full, uh, Abu Dhabi back in 2014. His first victory, by the way, was in Kiev back in 2013. Since that time, he's got three world championships. He's been red hot. He hasn't won in the last three races, but he's won eight of the last 23 races that he's been in, Jonathan. As he sights himself up, takes it wide. He's never finished a race here, Jonathan. Let's see what he can do here to move himself to number one. Yeah, and like I said earlier on, Steve, in, uh, in testing, Chiap is definitely running a longer boat. He's got one of these shorter boats, but he decided not to use it for London because of the conditions, and he did really well finishing second there. And exactly the same here. Looks as though the boat is very, very well planted on the water. You can see that it's he's just got a lot more control of this boat. It's probably slightly narrower in the tunnel definitely that little bit longer is he going to be able to improve on uh, on the time of Fanny al Kwamzi from the Middle East well as he slides himself up around the right hander now sets himself up on the long run down to five and six the conditions look just a tad better than what we've seen before as Philippe Shep hoping to grab his seventh career pole just one more corner to go on his first lap let's see if he can jump to the top of the charts here comes Shep coming by 
And the time on it is fastest by, look at him go, Jonathan. He improves that with a 51-1-8, almost three-tenths of a second quicker than Thaniel Quimzu. Good run, and there's no reason why this second lap shouldn't be even better again, because he looks, he now knows that the conditions are definitely getting better. See, throwing into that corner there, turn number three, as we call it, uh, here this weekend, and accelerating down. You can see how the boat is being thrown from side to side. Good acceleration. Definitely good handling on this boat. They actually have uh, their own in-house uh, propeller man. Uh, they call him Mr. Dynamite. He's been working with them very, very closely for the last three or four years and really has given this driver quite a lot of pace on the water. The other thing is that they do build propellers for different conditions. So let's see how he gets on on this lap. All right, as he comes by, can he improve on his 51-1-8? Philippe Chef comes by, does a 51-3-3. But a solid performance and a lot of uh, fingers being crossed now by the French team. As you look at uh, Philippe Desertan to the right, Eric Chan on the left. And uh, they feel uh, confident, but they don't feel totally confident, Jonathan. It'll be great to see here what's coming up next with Bartek Marzouak. And then, of course, Eric Stark, who stole the show in London. So for this man, Bartek Marzouak, he knows what he needs to do. He's got to improve on a 51 one eight. Yeah, I, I'd, I would like to see Bartek do well. I mean, um, you know, he's been there or thereabouts. He's, in, he's been improving immensely over the last couple of years. And uh, uh, we mentioned in London that he is struggling somewhat uh, for financial support at the moment. But he knows this boat very well. Um, he looked strong in practice and, uh, you know, he put up some pretty good times. So if, if anybody can do it, uh, this is the opportunity that he has not had for quite some time to really show what he's made of. Well, so fingers crossed for him. Well, this is the fourth time in his career he's made it to Q3. His best qualifying effort was last year here in France when he qualified a lowly 11th. So Bartek Marzouak doing his best. This is him for his seventh season. This is his 31st start. He's had three top five finishes in his career. And uh, one accident. Let's see what he can do here. Bartek Marswak, he is on the clock, Jonathan. And off he goes. What do you think? Well, I think he could have done a wider turn into uh, turn number six there before he straightened up for the start finish line. So he didn't have quite the speed that he could have had had he um, had he done that sort of, uh, had he done the wider line there. But we see him coming through number three there now. Uh, I think he's, he's been as fairly careful. We know the boat has got the pace, and we know he's got the capability to do this. Let's see how he takes the right-hander. All right, as he goes in through the right-hander, and the pace that he goes down all the way heading toward turn number five, and the conditions continue, I think, to hold up for him. Takes it a bit wide, Jonathan, now setting himself up. Let's see if he slides and scrubs a little speed off as he comes by. We'll hold our breath. Can he improve on a 51-1-8? Will he go to number one? There's the driver from Poland. And he comes through in that four spot. There's a 52-9-8. So he's 1.8 seconds off Philippe Shep's time. Yeah, let's see if he can be the first driver to improve on his second lap from his first lap. Because I noted, oh, when he's almost lost it there, Steve, as the boat just bounced off one of those waves. And uh, I don't think he's going to do it on this lap either. All right, Bartek Marswak. As we mentioned, only the fourth time he's made it to Q3. Continues to learn. And I'll tell you what, he was very impressive in those final few seconds of Q2 and to put himself squarely into the run here for pole position. It's not over yet. He's got about a third of a lap to go. All eyes from Poland watching this man. Bartak Marzowak heading toward turn number six. One final turn to go. He slides his way through. Can he get himself up and run faster in the second lap and challenge a 51-1-8? He comes by and he does a little bit better with a 52.77, but that leaves him still in that fourth place position, Jonathan. The difference between he and Philip Schapp, well, it's a 1.5 second difference. Yeah, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that when he was up there between number two and number three, when that boat went completely sideways and he had to back off, that definitely cost him some time. How much, we'll never know. But uh, this is the interesting uh, driver of the weekend, in my view. Um, uh, Eric Stark from Sweden. Um, 
been taken on board by Guido Capellini with the uh, Abu Dhabi team, as we said earlier, for the first time. And uh, looking very, very strong, very comfortable. He's fairly cool and collected. He's come from Formula 2. He's been Formula 2 world champion many times in the past. And that is a great grounding for Formula 1 uh, these days. So this could be the guy to watch, not only here today, if he gets it right, but uh, also in the Grand Prix tomorrow. So uh, Eric Stark, our last... Uh, guy out on the water today is he going to be able to get that pole position this is the third time jonathan he's gone to q3 in the four races that he has shown up for here in avion the other two times he qualified six for eric stark who started his career coming from formula two as you mentioned abu dhabi back in 2012 and as the driver works his way out the 30 year old from sweden is going to do his best his first victory came in harbin last year and of course he won two weeks ago in London and he has now moved himself up into third of the championship where he finished a year ago as he circles way wide Jonathan he's ready to go yeah and that's where Bartek he should have done that you see on the last lap but uh, as Stark comes through boom, the boat bouncing a little bit but I tell you what there's no fear with this driver as he hammers down the straight there 590 meters into turn number two let's just see how he takes it as he flies it along you can see how rough the water conditions are around the pin he goes heading up for turn number three Eric Stark looking for a second straight pole position and let's see if he can figure out a way to get his fourth career pole and this just his 28th start Eric Stark coming through and he is pushing through the right hander Jonathan yeah good turn there coming it down again there look at the way that the port is like a low flying aircraft as you go into number five number six oh just backs off a little bit there Steve lost a bit of time is he gonna do it all right as he comes way wide out of turn number six we hold our breath Eric Stark looking to unseat Philip Shep he needs a 51-17 as he go to the top Eric Stark does not he does a 52-1 that is only good for fourth place Jonathan I think he made a big mistake in that first lap he's gonna try to correct it here now and it's awful tough for a driver to go faster in that second lap than the first yeah but he knows he's already had a message on the radio to say you've got to make up a second if you can you're gonna have to really start pushing on this lap no more backing off on turn number five and number Ooh, six Jonathan, had before. Almost blew it over oh my teetering on the edge of disaster almost lost it there oh you can see he's giving it his all 110 percent as he flies down into that turn number five lost a bit of time there Steve it's probably uh, again backing off there it's easy as I said for me to say but I'm sure he's way through one heck of a ride as he goes around this circuit here in uh, Edwin we catch our breath he catches his does he move up any farther he does he goes to number one a spectacular lap for Eric Stark with a 51-17 he does it Jonathan as he does a tremendously strong lap by one one hundredth of a second Eric Stark has pole here in France well it looks like we that's the first time we've seen Mr. Capellini with a big smile on his face and it looks like the decision that he made a week ago to take Stark as part of that team is definitely paying off what a spectacular run and a heart throbbing performance on that final lap it looks like he was all but finished jonathan as he aired that boat out literally when you get the boat up like that you hit the brakes and it really slows you down a bit but it just shows you the speed and determination that he had we thought maybe he was going to be settling for fourth but boy he kept it down kept the foot hammered to the floor and what a remarkable finish one one hundred of a second quicker than philippe shep all eyes were on philippe shep and seeing if he could get his second career pole here but but he did not because Eric Stark stole the show and he moves to number one and Eric Stark will have the pole for tomorrow's 22nd Grand Prix of France so that's two in a row Steve we in London he he got that pole position and he dominated the race is he going to be doing the same sort of thing here in Evian in France this weekend We'll have to find out for the youngster, 30 years old, out of hey! Stockholm. <laughs> hey, I've been here before. <laughs> That's a great result for him. And it'll only build his confidence, won't it? Let's watch this again, Jonathan. Look at airs it out, almost lost it, almost ooh, went ooh, airborne, ooh. caught it back again. And as he came down in toward the right hander, Jonathan, we slow it down for you. And you see him launch off the wave, almost rotated and took off. Somehow got it back down in ground effect and saved it and continued on. And then went down into five and six. But you see how close he came, teetering on the edge of disaster. Oh, 
almost losing it, but he had enough to keep the boat from totally blowing over and ending his day in tears. And did you notice he did not take his foot off for the entire time that he was airborne? I mean, and that is the that is a sign of a quite a determined individual that desperately wants to get that pole position and wants to win this uh, this Grand Prix of France. Eric Stark showing his talents. And he comes walking away knowing he's got his fourth career pole position. Let's take a look at the results here in Q3 in the shootout battle for pole position. Eric Stark gets it done by one one hundredth of a second. We'll start number one tomorrow ahead of Philippe Shep, who is just hoping to finish a race here in Evian, who leads the point championship. Thonio Quimsey less than three tenths of a second back in third. Francesco Catanning have a solid day for Francesco Catano, eight tenths of a second back. Bartek Marzowak in only his fourth Q3 performance, solid 1.6 seconds back. And then Marit Stromoy looking for her second career pole position. She she did not get it, but what a great run she performed in the final few seconds in Q2 to elevate herself up into Q3. And uh, congratulations going around. All these guys are new teammates for him. Uh, this is yeah. kind of a, a big welcome committee for Eric Stark. And uh, you got to wonder what the shifting of uh, emotions is as you look at his father, Eric Stark, sky high, and Sean Torrente going, Ugh. and then Thaniel Quimsey up in the top three. So Team Abu Dhabi won three today here in France. Yeah, great result there. And I mean, all credit to him for, you know, being completely out of shape and, and just stealing that lap, lap by one one hundredth of a second. And he's a very, very popular driver, Steve. He's, he's always cheerful. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's just got a nice way about him. And, uh, you know, I, I, let's just hope that he has a good run now right the way through to the, to the, uh, to the end of the year. Eric Stark, of course, he's a great personality, a fun guy, very approachable. He takes life uh, with a lot of gusto. And uh, I'll tell you something, uh, it'll be interesting to see how he does tomorrow because this race course is going to be a lot different than what we saw two weeks ago in London. You know, it's not flat out, down and back. It's really going to be a survival course. And there'll be a question of whether he can take it all away from start to finish tomorrow for Eric Stark. Yeah, and the other thing with Stark was this as he gets congratulated by Marit. She, she could obviously see what had happened there. But the other thing with Stark is that, I'll tell you what, his father looked pleased as well. And do you know why? He can at last put his checkbook away, you know? Because that's all he's, he's been funding this kid for a long time. And, uh, you know, now he's finally got that break. He's finally with a top team that can take over from all that hard work and that uh, the funding that his father has uh, put his way over the last couple of years. So he must be well chuffed. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was great. It was great timing by him winning the race in London because all of a sudden not one but two teams offered services immediately to him yeah. to carry on through that 2018 season. He took the high bid. He took the first bid. He's very happy. And <laughs> tell you what, his father is, as you mentioned, happy that he doesn't have to sit there and write any more checks. And they. <laughs> Wow, 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 wow.